the Word of God, which is the foundation for living. From Westminster Presbyterian Church, 20 6th Avenue Southwest, with Reverend Joseph Reed. And now, following these announcements, Reverend Reed. Good morning. I'm Eugenia Henry, a member of the Westminster Presbyterian Church family. Thank you for tuning in today to hear God's word. Please continue to join us each Sunday morning from 1015 until 1030 here on WATV 900 AM. And now, here are today's announcements. Our Sunday school begins at 9.30 each Sunday morning. Join us for a lively discussion. Mrs. Bonetta Wyatt is our superintendent. Our weekly Bible study class meets each Monday at 5.30 p.m. and is led by our pastor, the Reverend Joseph Reed. Please know you are always welcome to worship with us each Sunday. Our service begins promptly at 11 a.m. and ends at approximately 12 noon. Following a musical selection, the Reverend Reed. <laughs> child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and peace 
there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. understand the miracle of your birth and through that understanding realize the real <coughs> meaning of Christmas. Amen. 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 You've heard it many times. He went there to register with Mary, his betrothed, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Luke 2, 5. 
A Jewish lady named Mrs. Rosenberg was stranded late one night at a fashionable resort, one that did not admit Jews. The desk clerk said to her, yet again, sorry, no room. The Jewish lady said, but your son says that you have vacancies. You know, ma'am, we don't admit Jews, he said. Now, if you try the other side of town, she said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want you to know I've converted to Christianity. The desk clerk said, oh, yeah? Let me test you then. How was Jesus born? Mrs. Rosenberg replied very quickly. He was born to a virgin named Mary in a little town called Bethlehem. He said, very good, very good. Tell me more. He was born in a manger. And why was he born in a manger? Mrs. Rosenberg replied loudly, because so-called godly men like you wouldn't give a Jewish lady a room for the night. <laughs> Please join me as I speak to you on the subject, conception from above. Many of us could substitute ourselves for Mrs. Rosenberg and share stories of a not so great Christmas atmosphere both long, long ago and now. There are reports this week from CNN, according to the network, the week before Christmas, chants of protests are being heard or have been heard across America in recent weeks. They echoed Wednesday in the small town where the civil rights movement reached a crescendo five decades or 50 years ago. They were talking about the march that was held this week in Selma, Alabama. The network said about 20 protesters walked up Selma's famed Edmund Pettus Bridge and yelled, hands up, don't shoot, and I can't breathe in reference to the deaths of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and Eric Garner in New York. Both men were young, both men were black. Brown had just graduated from high school. Neither will experience Christmas this year. We could focus, as many are doing on this tragedy, or we could focus on the miracle highlighted by Mrs. Rosenberg that Jesus was born to a virgin named Mary. A virgin having a child is one of the miracles of Christmas. It is a phenomenon often overlooked. Many of us miss this marvel as we focus on what's left on our Christmas list, amen? <laughs> Visits from our family and friends, holiday plans, what we're gonna serve for dinner on Thursday, right? And finally we get around to the birth of Jesus Christ. Last week we told you of the miraculous birth of John the Baptist. The important thing we said about his birth was his message. 
Sure, he was the forerunner to Jesus Christ, but why? He preached the good news of Jesus coming, but he made it clear that in order to receive him, we must repent, turn our life around, and return to God. In other words, the only way to understand and live the message of Christ is through repentance. But even before the message of Christmas is heard, we must acknowledge the conception that occurred from above that signals God's power to do anything and everything beyond our understanding. To accept the mystery of Jesus' origin is to accept all that follows in two ways. One, we accept in faith that Jesus could not be conceived by human act. Why should the creator create himself by a creature he created? I'm going to say that again. Why would the creator create himself by a creature he created? This is why the scripture says regarding Jesus' birth, and it's pretty controversial for the theologians. Therefore, this is Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself, that's God himself, will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child. In the Revised Standard Version, it says, the young woman will be with child. And theologians have been discussing that since it was translated. But this is the conception from above that gets our attention. And will give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel, God with us. Now Matthew, in the same revised version, used the word version. In the same revised version of the Bible, in Isaiah it was young woman, in Matthews it was virgin. We both agree, or we all agree, that it was a miraculous what? Birth. Second, we trust that our ways are not God's ways. In this context, we accept the actions of Joseph who had no part in the creation of Jesus. Our text says he went there to register. He was following the decree of Caesar's Augustus. He went and registered with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and she was already, what? Expecting a child. In the Jewish tradition, <laughs> That would have been an absolute no pa or uh, fu pa. Only God could make this wonder possible. If we believe He did this, and I believe He did, how can we not believe the miracle of Jesus' birth? How can we not believe the miracles He performed when He was alive? How can we not believe that He died? and he rose again. It all comes together. All this says is that Jesus Christ is God. It adds up to this, this Christmas. This celebration is about the phenomenal power of God to intercede in history and make it possible for all of us to receive salvation. Everything done by God 
especially the birth of Jesus, was for our salvation, both now and in the world to come. The miracle of Christmas is the incredible conception of Jesus from above. And for these blessings, we lift our voice in praise. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Without that miraculous conception, there would be no salvation. And that's something to really celebrate throughout the year. And the church said, Amen. To the Word of God, which is the foundation for living from the Westminster Presbyterian Church, 20 6th Avenue Southwest, with Reverend Joseph Reed. And now, until next time, let the church say, Amen.
Let us pray. In the name of love, we beseech thee, Lord, to allow us to begin again with the help of those who have gone before us. Amen. Amen. This is that time of year from the book of Luke. Most of you, over your many, many years, are very familiar with John, the forerunner to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That 17th verse of the first chapter is what I'm going to focus on. And he will go before the Lord. That means before Christ. That means before God. He will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. We'll talk a little bit more about that power, that spirit of Elijah. But he'll go for a particular reason, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people, you and me, prepared for Christmas, prepared for the Lord, prepared for Jesus Christ. An atheist and Jesus was out fishing and the atheist accidentally dropped the oar and watched it float away. Jesus stepped out of the boat, walked across the water to the oar, grabbed it, and walked back to the boat. I would imagine if that happened and I was in that boat, I'd be pretty shocked. The next day, a friend asked the atheist if he had enjoyed fishing with the Lord. It was okay, he replied. But would you believe that guy can't even swim? <laughs> And so it may be with the series coming up on the power of new beginnings. The atheists missed the miracle. And many of us may miss the point of what beginning again in God is all about. Each day we begin our new life in God. If we wake up, if our feet can be planted on the floor and we can rise up out of our beds and go on with whatever business we're going about. It's a new beginning. But to fit what we shall talk about over the next several weeks into a logical understanding, we will use the word beginning as a metaphor for the word love. The coming of the baby Jesus into the world, who God manifesting himself, think about this, in human form, because he loved the world, especially the creature created in his image and in his likeness to prepare us for that coming righteousness, he sent a prophet. Clearly, John the Baptist was a prophet in the tradition of Elijah. So you see the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He sent a prophet whose birth was miraculous on its own. Please join me as I speak to you briefly on the subject, forerunner to the beginning. Forerunner to the beginning. Here's the good news. Do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Now, kids might think that means they're going to get what? Everything on their list. <laughs> As I was getting ready to get up, I noticed on my phone 
the Christmas list for my son and my daughter. <laughs> we know what's on their mind, don't we? <laughs> the birth of John the Baptist to Elizabeth, the old wife of the righteous priest Zechariah, who prayed for the miracle of a son in his old age, that miracle had come to pass. John is the forerunner to the Lord. John is a herald, a forerunner, one who goes before to unconditional love. I like to say that God is love. But more important for us to understand when we talk about the baby Jesus, especially love is God. A little bit different way of looking at it, especially during this holiday season. John is a joy and delight. And many rejoice because he was born. For he was great, we're talking about John, in the sight of the Lord, the scripture says. The Lord, the scripture says he was filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. He brought us back to the Lord. And he brought us back to genuine love. John's message of repentance and baptism lays the foundation for a new life in Christ, which is our new beginning. No matter what your worries are, no matter what your concerns are, no matter what your anxieties are and your troubles are, this is an opportunity for a new beginning in Christ. But John's message of repentance and baptism is the key to having a good Christmas. To experience this new beginning, we must embrace John's spirit and his message. The problem is many of us want to embrace the Christ of love without embracing the forerunner to love. This is why many of us get bogged down sometimes this time of year because of the expense, because of the family relations, because of all of the things that we got to do in order to get into the spirit of Christmas. We get lost in the commercial aspects of Christmas. And we miss the message of Christ. There are two reasons for this. First, briefly, because we have not taken seriously John as the forerunner to Christ and his message of repentance. Our text says, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children, not to give them presents, to turn the hearts of their parents to their children, and it says, the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Have you ever thought about Christmas? <clears throat> as a way of turning your heart and your mind toward the wisdom of the righteous? That was John's job. He was to go before the Lord and turn our hearts and minds, not to what it's going to cost, not to the Christmas tree, not to the depletion of our bank account, Somebody say amen. amen. And it's going to be depleted. You got to work a half a year to make up for the money you lose during Christmas. 
why was there a need for someone to go before the Lord in the first place? Why did the Lord need somebody to go before him? Because the logical mind does not understand the need for repentance unless we stop to consider our wrongs or why our life is not what we want it to be beforehand. This was the reason for John's coming. This was the reason for a voice of one calling in the wilderness. What is the wilderness? But our life without God as the son. What is Christmas without Christ as the center? John cried, prepare the way for the Lord. John cried, make straight his path. This means, in order for us to really appreciate Christmas, our house must be in order. If our house is not in order, Christmas is going to be a drag. You'll be finding yourself saying, I can't get into the spirit of Christmas this year. You might need to do some what? House cleaning before you celebrate the holidays. I don't mean clean up before you put the tree up. <laughs> Second, John dispatched, or his dispatch was the fulfillment of the message of the prophets. John's mission is defined in Isaiah 43 through five. His mission was a voice calling in the wilderness, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert, a highway for our God. In Jesus, every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged place is plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. Have you heard that before? That's Martin Luther King. It's interesting how it got into the message from John the Baptist, especially as a what? Forerunner to Christmas. Not to civil rights, not to human rights, but as a forerunner to what? The celebration of Christmas. The spirit, our text says, the spirit and the power of Elijah will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of righteousness. That's telling us what Christmas should be all about. What was the spirit and power of Elijah? It was a spirit and power explained in Malachi 3.1, who will prepare the way before me? Then suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come into his temple, straight out of the book of Malachi. What temple? The temple of our lives. That means Christmas, through John, opens the door for us to receive God. But we again got to do what? Some house cleaning in order for that to happen. In other words, John announces the message of the Lord. In order to hear Christmas, in order to hear Christ, in order to hear his message of unconditional love, we must repent. That means to turn around. That means we must return to God, not just at Christmas time, but every day of our lives. Our baptism is just a what? Symbol of that return to God. Before we can receive Christ and before we can celebrate Christmas, we must make sure that we've returned to God. This is what the celebration and candles that the Floyds lit this morning 
is really all about. We are anticipating the coming of our Lord to change our lives as never before. John is the forerunner, and each Christmas is a new beginning. It adds up to this. A people prepared for the Lord, following the message of the forerunner to the beginning, which is eternal love. This is a love that saves, this love that is now and in the world to come. The message that begins our Christmas celebration is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Amen.